Welcome, folks, to another edition of Tiffin Cast. I'm your host, Seishu, and today I am speaking with a photographer who creates intimate personal work, and his name is Ernesto Bazan. Ernesto and I met almost 20 years ago at Julia Dean's uh, gathering in Malibu, and although we haven't kept in touch, I have actually been a huge follower of his and I've been receiving his emails and newsletters and uh, about his workshops and his books. Uh, recently, I just found out that he just uh, launched a Kickstarter campaign to fund a very special project of his. And this segment is really about talking to him about what motivated him to, to do the project and why he's doing it. So, uh, Ernesto, welcome to the show. Hi, how are you? Thank you, sir. Thanks for joining us here. Um, I, let's just launch right into it. Uh, the last, and, and you're saying it's the, the, the final uh, part of the trilogy of your books on Cuba is called Isla. And it's a Kickstarter campaign that's uh, just launched uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, what, what started the idea that you were going to do uh, three books? Did you even have an idea that, okay, I'm going to probably come up with three books on Cuba? Or is it just something that sort of happened naturally? It happened naturally, as you just said. I had no clue that while living for 14 years of my life in Cuba, that I was even creating one book. As I like to say, I simply had fun taking pictures. And uh, in 2001, something happened. Uh, from 92, which was the year I arrived to Cuba, up to 2001, I only used one camera loaded with black and white film. But then in 2001, uh, for various reasons, uh, I started carrying three cameras, one around my neck and two strapped around my shoulders, one with a collar in it, and one with a black and white, but with a different type of format, the panoramic format. So from 2001 to 2006, the last year of my stay in Cuba, I nonchalantly photographed with the three of them. And it felt very beautiful and I would say almost easy, even though sort of it was schizophrenic. And uh, I have to honestly say that I've been unable to do that type of uh, switching um, in the years after I left Cuba. So now I'm just shooting again <laughs> with one camera. And, uh, you know, by doing that, I was creating a body of work in color, which specifically focused on rural Cuba and my my farmer's friends that I visited often during my stay because they remind me so much of my Sicilian childhood when I used to spend a lot of time with farmers. With the two black and white cameras, I kept photographing uh, in 35 millimeter format uh, which I, as I said, I started using in 92. And that was uh, what brought the first book of the Cuban trilogy to light in 2008, and it was called Bazan Cuba. And then at the same time, I was using black and white with this panoramic camera, and the format really forced me to use a different approach in order to frame and choose the subjects and the moments that I was interested in. Then, you know, I moved out of Cuba and, you know, the project in a very beautiful way have slowly started coming up one after the other. So Isla finally should be the last chapter of this unimaginable Cuban trilogy. And, you know, that's why the Kickstarter campaign. Uh, let's back up a little bit. I, I want to know exactly why you chose to go to Cuba in the first place. What is it about Cuba that attracted you to the, the island? Uh, to be completely honest with you, it was just curiosity. Mm, I'd seen pictures that other friends mm -hmm. sort of taken in the past. 
And the one day I finally realized, keep going. And one day I finally realized that you know it was the time for me to go there, having no idea that you know that very first trip to Cuba was going to change my life in so many different ways. Um, so it was out of curiosity, but it was also on a deeper level, a very important part of my destiny to go to Cuba. Uh, in Cuba, I met my future wife. And in Cuba, we had the blessing of having our twin boys. The same year that I got my twin boys, it was the year that I had the privilege to win the W. G. Smith Documentary Award uh, for which I had applied at least 10 times before. Wow. Of all the times, you know, when did I get it? I got it the year that my twin boys were born, which, uh, you know, I like to believe brought me luck. And thanks to my Cuban pictures, you know, my work has been sort of become more visible and more known. And now, you know, we are getting close to, uh, you know, to complete the trilogy. Uh, you've got, you've got obviously uh, a, a massive amount of images from from Cuba. Um, and, and if someone said Ernesto Bazan, I'm sure the next word would be Cuba. Would, would that be a fair assessment that you're known for your Cuba work? Yeah, I mean... Right now, I would say yes. I mean, I have uh, other books that have come in the past, which incidentally I'm sort of offering as perks during the, during the Kickstarter campaign, which are my first two books, one called The Perpetual Past, which came out in 1983. So we're talking about over 30 years ago and it's out of print, and it's become a collector item, along with Passing Through, which is also uh, an out-of-print book. Um, so, but, you know, I start winning several awards, like the one I mentioned, I got a Guggenheim Fellowship, among other things, you know, thanks to my Cuba work. And the uniqueness of this Cuba work is that the three books that are now becoming a reality, they were all self-published with the amazing help, generous help of many of my students. Since 2002, I started teaching workshops and in Cuba was the first location. Then because of my workshop in Cuba, I was also forced out of the island because of that. Uh, and that's why I moved to Mexico. But, you know, I kept teaching in other locations, including Mexico, uh, Brazil, Italy, United States, Peru, among other places. And since I go back to teach every year, at least once or twice, to all these locations. And I've been doing that for 13 years. You see, I've had the privilege to both help over several hundred students throughout the years to get better with their work. But at the same time, I've had the priceless opportunity to only shoot my work. In other words, before that, prior to 2002, I was working as a freelance photographer and doing a lot of commercial work. For the last 13 years of my life, I've only been able, thank God, I should say, to only shoot my work, which means that eventually, you know, some of the work from the countries I mentioned will become future books. The other things to, know, to, to notice, which I think is very important, is that the reason why in 2006, after arriving to Mexico, I decided with my students to create 
the publishing house mm -hmm. is not only to publish my work, but to also publish the outstanding work that some of my students are creating as we speak. God willing, next year, 2015, wow. the first of a series of books by my students will come out. And, you know, it will be an amazing joy for all of us to be able to see, to be able to hold in our hands this first book of a series of books that will slowly come out. And in 10 years down the line, when we'll be able to see five to 10 titles by my students, I mean, just imagine, it's a unique way, it's a unique philosophy of teaching, mm -hmm. of collaborating, and of giving back. Mm -hmm. This is the key word, giving back, because my students have given so much to me. First of all, you know, with their scholarship, I mean, with their workshop fee, uh, you know, they have been helping me making a decent living, too. You know, with the, the outpour of generosity that they have uh, given to me, both in the creating and financial aspects of self-publishing the books, you know, they've given me so much freedom, so much independence. So publishing their books, and I'm not publishing because they're my students or because they've helped me. I like to say that the books that are coming out are outstanding work of photography, and I will put them on the international photographic map. Excellent. Because right now they're completely unknown, but once the books will come out, people in the world will be able to see the caliber of their work. That's fantastic. I just spoke with somebody today uh, about how uh, books are important still. I mean, even though it costs an incredible amount of money to produce a book, or produce a photo book, uh, there still holds so much value in terms of uh, in terms of it being a, a teaching tool, in terms of it being a, a piece of art in itself. Um, I remember one of your earlier books. I mean, they it folded out and they you know and there were leaves of uh, of images you know, and it it was just an experience that uh, you 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 don't get when you're sitting in front of a computer monitor, right? So uh, I, I applaud what you're what you're doing with uh, the publishing aspect of it. If you don't mind, uh, I'd love to go back to the the book project that you're you're looking to raise money for, which is Isla. Um, you, you mentioned it's, it's an all panoramic book. Uh, the images are all panoramas. Uh, and they're all black and white. Is that right? Yeah. Um, have, have these images been seen outside of your, your studio? Have they been, have they been uh, in a gallery of any kind? Or is it yeah. just... It's a complete premiere of the work. Wonderful. Uh, you see... In the process of making the books, what happened is that I almost forgot uh, that I'd taken those pictures. I mean, I did have, I did make uh, what I like to call work prints mm -hmm. as, uh, you know, when I still had more time to spend in the darkroom. But then, you know, once we left Cuba, we arrived to Mexico in 2006, I mean, the only things that it was clear to me, it was that, you know, the 35 millimeter work, the work that won, uh, you know, the awards at the World Press, Eugene Smith and Guggenheim, you know, had the priority to come out. It was also the most comprehensive work that I'd done because mm -hmm. it was over a period of 14 years. Uh, but then, you know, the other pictures I only kept in boxes. And then, as I said in the Kickstarter campaign, one day after Al Campo, the color book, came out, I finally had the time to just open up this old box of prints. And it was, I, was, I was astounded by what I saw. So what do I mean by that? I mean, I knew that I'd taken those pictures. Uh, because I'd printed them, because I'd taken them. Mm -hmm. But then somehow, you know, they just 
rested inside this box like uh, a good bottle of wine <laughs> waiting to age. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I saw the images and I said, wow. And then I said to myself, no, maybe it's just me because I'm the author and all of that. Yeah. But then I merely invited uh, my best friend, Juan de la Cruz, who lives also here in Veracruz, to dinner one night. And without telling him anything, I said, take a look at this. And his immediate reaction <clears throat> was very similar to mine. So once I realized that it wasn't just me thinking that those images could easily become a third and final body of work on the same island, I start sharing with many more students. And it took us about two years of editing and sequencing and everything. And now we are really trying, as I said, in the Kickstarter campaign, bring Isla to shore. And it's important not just because I've made a trilogy. I don't think that is that important. I mean, I'm in awe when I think that without even being conscious of that, I was taking pictures which eventually would become three different books. What makes me feel so happy is that finally... I can be a very unique and important chapter of my life to closure. Uh, and it's not just about the Cuba books. It's a closure of a very important period of my life in general. Uh, my father passed away six months ago, and that was a major closure as well. In the book, at the end, uh, one of my students and I, once again, have uh, this beautiful conversation which is divided in three acts in which not only do I talk about the pictures, the process and all of that, but I also talk about my Sicilian childhood, uh, the, re the relationship with my parents and the importance that each one of which one of them has had on me for different reasons, among other things. And I also talk about his passing. Indeed. Uh, right before we started recording, I asked how you describe yourself. And I, I started to say you're a documentary photographer. And you said, no, 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 I'm not a documentary photographer in the classic sense. Uh, I am I am a photographer who creates intimate and personal work. How important is it for photographers today to pursue intimate personal work? I think it's essential. Um, I like to say that, you know, is the only type of work that can really feed our soul. Uh, and our soul is the connection to what I like to describe our internal eye, the true eye, not our physical eyes, but the true eye that allows us to feel about life, to feel about our fellow human beings, to feel about ourselves, and then in the case of photography, to react to our to this connection between our soul and the internal eye and eventually take some pictures of that. So it's key. You see, I'm free of commercial uh, you know, jobs. I don't have to deal with magazines anymore. I mean, I, I liked it. I did it for over 20 years. But you see, now I have this incredible freedom. My students have become my, uh, my magazines, my collectors, my supporters, my advisors, my assistants, my friends. So I'm very, very happy. I need to say something that maybe will sort of explain to your audience a bit better uh, what I'm trying to say. See, the way I became a photographer back in 1977 was not just like uh, I woke up uh, or I said to myself or to my parents, okay, I'm going to become a photographer. I became a photographer thanks to a dream that I had. I was only 17 years old. I was about to graduate from high school. And to be honest with you, I had no idea of what I wanted to do. But I had this dream, and it's not 
just the dream itself, which I find very uncanny. I mean, the dream was, I heard a voice saying, spelling out four words, you've got to be a photographer. The uncanny of the dream was that the next morning, I remembered those words, and with complete uh, self-assurance, I went straight to my parents and I told them, I'm going to become a photographer. So today, during our conversation uh, with you, uh, Seshu, I can tell you 35 years later that I'm still following this dream. And becoming a teacher was another revelation. And as I like to say, Seshu, I am the only one who has to believe in this. I don't have to convince anybody. But I know <clears throat> that that is the way it is. I don't know why <clears throat> I've been picked sort of by this divine uh, force, but it is like that. Mm -hmm. And the self-publishing or the idea of creating the small publishing house, uh, going completely against the, the current, against all odds, is proving to me that, you know, I am here on this earth to follow my path, and that is my path. That's lovely. Um, and I, I hope those who are listening in can rewind and listen to that all over again, because I think there's so many lessons in there for all of us. You've brought, um, you've, you've brought upon the subject of divine grace and blessings and uh, having the 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 uh, the benefit of having these gifts from your students. Um, I'm interested in knowing a little bit more about uh, how your faith directs your photography. Does it direct your photography at all? Oh, very much so. Lately, I find myself saying. I even said that in the in the Kickstarter video. I mean, you asked me, what do you photograph? And my reply is, I've been photographing the sacredness of life in its myriad forms. What do, I, what do I mean by that? I mean that everything that happens in our life daily, every second of it, it's sacred. If we really start paying <clears throat> attention, attention to how precious life can be, as I said before, I mean, my father's demise really opened up my eye to what's really important. And if you really think about that, <clears throat> you realize that the very important things in our life are very few. And they've been the same for millenniums, you know, meaning our health, mm -hmm. being good health. Uh, being a decent person, being a loving person, uh, if you have kids, trying to, you know, guide them through life. And photography is just an extension of all of that. And um, so I try to photograph both moment of sadness, moment of desperation, and moments of joy, moments of uh, you know, being cheerful or caring. So, you know, what I would describe the spectrum, the wider spectrum of life. So faith has a major role. Um, I mean, and the more, the more I photograph, the more faith becomes apparent. I'll give you a good example. And once again, <laughs> I know... Some of your listeners might believe that I speak like or I sound like a preacher, but I don't care. I mean, what I, what I believe is that this energy that has been accompanying me for over 35 years period is really finally showing to me that it's not enough, even though I've been doing that all my life, to photograph uh, faith-related uh, celebrations such as processions or, you know, pilgrimages and stuff like that. This energy is now telling me clearly that starting this year, 
I need to start trekking and walking for days along with the pilgrims because only by sharing the harshness of the trekking, the harshness of the walk, I can really be exposed to moments of fate which go well beyond the moment of fate that I've been photographing so far. So, as I already declared, alone or with some of my students, next December, uh, I'm going to walk <clears throat> for four days from this Mexican city called Puebla all the way to Mexico City to pay homage to the Virgin of Guadalupe. So I'm, I'm sure this answers your question. Indeed, indeed. Um, the last question I have for you, and this has been such a riveting uh, discussion, exchange of ideas, it's, it's, it's blowing my mind. Uh, I, I want to know, what is it that you want your audience, those, those who pick up each one of your books on Cuba to know about Cuba, about the people of Cuba? What do you want them to know? Well, I mean, first of all, I want them to see my love for them, um, my caring for them. Uh, of course, you know, they will also be able to see the plight of the Cuban people. Uh, because some of the pictures really show this endless wait that the Cubans have been living for over 50 years, uh, you know, the difficult situation that they face and the lack of freedom, which I immediately put in the, in the Kickstarter video, which, see, I've been photographing water in Cuba, but even though Cuba is a Caribbean island and there are beautiful beaches and turquoise sea and all of that. Since I was living there, I could see that for many Cubans, the sea was a sort of Berlin Wall. And it has been. Uh, many people have perished at sea. Many people are still living or trying to escape daily from Cuba um, by sea. So by living inside of Cuba, I, of course, was able to perceive and experience a quite different experience than the ones of the, of the tourists that go there and have a great time for 10 days and they say that Cuba is great and it's all, there's so much fun. So, I mean, it's, Cuba is also that because Cuban Cubans are really incredible human, human beings. And one of the things that I show in the books is the indomitable spirit that they have, that no matter what, some of them can still have fun, some of, some of them can still be optimistic about life, even though their situation uh, wants you to believe the opposite. So these are among these, the things the feelings, the emotion that I put into my pictures. But as much as they are about the Cubans, they are about me, Ernesto Bazan, how he felt about himself and how he felt about the Cubans. Ernesto, thank you so much for joining us on this uh, wonderful conversation. I, I, I thank you for your time. Um, I can't wait for the book, and hopefully, uh, as, as a, a, a backer uh, for the Kickstarter campaign, I hope I get all three books. Uh, it's it's been on my list of things to 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 study essentially, um, and I hopefully we can do that. So thank you so much. I, I thank you uh, very much, first of all, for giving me this opportunity to share my life with you and uh, I think it was very special because you were the first backer and uh, I think this conversation will bring me luck and hopefully we'll be able to raise the additional funds needed. Thank you very much and I look forward to maybe seeing you in New York or wherever destiny will want us to meet. Absolutely. Thank you again. Bye-bye. 
All right, take care. If you want, send me a link to the radio conversation later on, okay? Most definitely, we'll do that. All right, you have a good heart uh, and uh, I wish you the best and I really hope more, more so than before that we can connect in the future, okay? Thank you. Most definitely. Thank you so much. It's been an All honor. Right. Take care. Okay, Bye. take care. Bye-bye.